Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa alihi wa sahbihi wa ala um, To proceed, ikhwan uh, These sessions um, That we are continuing on With after Isha Are for those brothers who can attend And, you know, are free They don't have engagements in the morning, etc So, no pressure at all, ikhwan you know, please attend if you can and benefit because this is why we're doing it. But, you know, at the least, you're going to get the other sessions that were before Maghrib, or sorry, after Maghrib, after Asr, so on and so forth. These sessions, inshallah, are a bit more intense, a bit more in-depth. And for those who are, you know, really dedicating this weekend to benefit Allah Ta'ala. The topic, inshallah, we will be talking about right now is a very important topic that is closely attached to the matter of seeking knowledge. It is called Afatu Talab al The Afat of the seeking of knowledge. Afat is the plural of Afa. And Afa can sometimes be translated to mean a parasite. So a parasite, as we define it, is a creature that lives off of another creature causing nothing but harm for that which it's living upon. This is how the biologists might define it. Now, but in our definition, what we are talking about really are the things that negatively affect your seeking of knowledge or may even cause the seeking of knowledge to be a harm to the individual who is afflicted by one of these parasites or conditions. This is extremely important because as you know from the methodology of the people of the sunnah is that they don't just learn the khayr and stop there. It is from the methodology of the people of the sunnah is that they also learn the sharr, that which is evil, that which is harmful in order to what? To protect themselves from it. Hudayf ibn al-Yaman radiallahu ta'ala anhu in the well-known narration that is in Bukhari and Muslim he began that narration with a tremendous statement. He said, the people used to ask Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the khayr, about good. I used to ask him about evil for fear that it would catch up to me. For fear that evil would catch up to him. So from the methodology of a person of the sunnah, is that just like they learn the khayr, likewise they learn the evil in order to protect themselves from it, to stay safe from it, to veer away from it, to recognize where it can be found, and steer clear of trouble. Think about it this way. You're traversing a road by night. You have a general idea where you want to get to. Although it's the night time, you know you're going to Keep heading that way and inshallah you'll get to your destination. This is the knowledge of knowing the khayr. But knowing the evil is that detailed knowledge of the road where you know there's a pothole right there. And there's nails over there. And there's some robbers that are lying in ambush up ahead in that area. That detailed knowledge of the evil is that which will allow you to navigate that road and to take that path having escaped all of those harms and arrive at your destination unscathed by all these different areas of trouble. So this is the reason that we pay attention to these kinds of matters because they save us and save our efforts and make sure that we don't lose what we have invested in this khayr. The poet said, عَرَفْتُ الشَّرَّ لَا لِلشَّرِّ لَكِنْ لِتَوَقِّيهِ وَمَنْ لَا يَعْرِفِ الشَّرَّ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ يَقْعَ فِيهِ I learned the evil not for the sake of evil, rather to avoid it. For indeed he who doesn't recognize the evil from the good, he will end up falling into it. So, Alhamdulillah, today we have heard a lot about the virtues of knowledge. And indeed, Hafiz al-Hakami rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi He has some extremely beautiful poetry describing knowledge and its virtues. Some extremely sweet words. 
that really paint a picture for you of how the scholars view knowledge. That in addition to all that we've heard today from the ayat of the Qur'an and the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I wanted to share some of those verses with you. He said, rahimahullah ta'ala, Ya talib al-ilmi la tabghi bihi badala, faqad dhafirta wa rabbi al-lawhi wal-qalami. O seeker of knowledge, seek no replacement for it, for indeed you have won, I swear by the Lord of the tablet and the pen, meaning the preserved tablet and the pen that wrote everything that shall occur until the day of judgment. As a point of benefit, it is permissible to swear by the attributes of Allah and His descriptions. For you are still swearing by Allah. If you say, I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba, you're still swearing by Allah. This is different from swearing by other than Allah, that which is forbidden, that which is kufr and shirk. Right? So here he's swearing by an attribute of Allah, the Lord of Allah, wal qalam, the preserved tablet and the pen. He said, do not seek a replacement for it or something other than it, for indeed you have won. In other words, if you have chosen this path, the path of seeking knowledge, if you have made this a part of your life, then surely you have hit upon the most successful of all paths ever in existence. There is no profession that is more noble. There is no track that will lead you higher. There is nothing that will gain you more or cause more profits. That indeed is the loftiest path in this life. Another thing he said, رحمه الله تعالى وَقَدِّسِ الْعِلْمَ وَعْرِفْ قَدْرَ حُرْمَتِهِ فِي الْقَوْلِ وَالْفِعْلِ وَالْآدَابَ فَالْتَزِمِ And hold the knowledge as sacred. And come to recognize how precious it is in both statements and actions and adhere to its manners. وَجْهَدْ بِعَزْمٍ قَوِيٍّ لَمْ ثِنَاءَ لَهُ لَوْ يَعْلَمِ الْمَرْءُ قَدْرَ الْعِلْمِ لَمْ يَنَمِ This is truly worthy of contemplation. He said, And strive بِعَزْم With perseverance قَوِي That has strength to it Allahu That never wanes, never relaxes. لَوْ يَعْلَمُ الْمَرْءُ قَدْرَ الْعِلْمِ لَمْ يَنَمِ For if truly a man recognized the value of knowledge, he would cease to sleep. You know, Ya Ikhwan, if you look at the biographies of the people of knowledge, Sheikh ibn Baz, Sheikh al-Albani, Sheikh ibn Uthaymeen, from the modern day scholars, for example, and many others, one of the things you will notice is a common trait amongst these people of knowledge is how little they sleep. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to sleep at night and then get up and make night prayers. You may wonder, what's the connection between night prayers and knowledge? The connection is in the fact that his night prayers sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would involve abundant recitation of the Qur'an in which he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would sometimes recite up to sometimes in a single rak'ah al-Baqarah, al-Nisa and Ali Imran in succession in a single rak'ah in taraweeh that takes us about 10 days approximately something like that right in a single rak'ah one rak'ah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he would read the seven qiwal, the seven long ones, in seven raka'at in succession. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sometimes. Now, how does the messenger read, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the hadith that describes his night prayer? The sahabi said, he reads slowly. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Dwelling upon the Qur'an. If he passes by a verse that contains tasbih, glorification, magnification, exaltment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he stops and he exalts. If he passes by a verse that contains the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he stops and he asks for some. And if he passes by a verse that contains a matter of fear, he will stop and ask Allah for refuge. This is not the recitation of someone who is just basically trying to get to the end of the chapter. This is recitation with what? Pondering and contemplation. This recitation 
is actually a foundation in seeking knowledge. This recitation, in the night time, when you're alone with the Qur'an, seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no one to distract you or anything to conflict with your niyyah, with your intention. This becomes a foundation for your seeking of knowledge. A student of knowledge came to Imam Ahmed, he stayed over at his place. And Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala, back then as you know, they didn't have what we have today, the plumbing and so on and so forth. So he had to bring him water. In the morning when an Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala came to the man for Fajr, given that it is a vessel, it was easy to see that the water was still at the same level. In other words, this water was untouched, it wasn't used. So Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah ta'ala, he was surprised by this. He was amazed. Why was he amazed? The man prayed Isha, and now he's about to pray Fajr. Why should Imam Ahmed be amazed that none of the water was used? The reason is, now. Huh? That's okay. He's a student of life, and? He did not pray night prayers. He said, a student of knowledge. And you don't have a portion of the night. So the man responded, I was a traveler. You know, it's not upon me to pray the night prayers. It's not obligatory. Even given that I'm a traveler, it's less obligatory. He said, even if Abdul Razak made Hajr, made Hajj. Who's Abdul Razak, Yaqwan? Who has the name? Naam. Sanani, Ahsan. Naam, Abdul Razak al Sanani, the teacher of Imam Ahmed, one of the greatest scholars of hadith. He said, even if Abdul Razak made the Hajj and did not sleep except in sujood, meaning despite the fact that he was in Hajj, and Hajj is an extremely arduous journey back then, our Ustad can tell us more about that, despite the fact. Despite how tired he is, he made night prayers. And he was so tired, ended up falling asleep in sujood. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. This is a fundamental for seeking knowledge. We ask Allah to make us all from the people of night prayers. The time you spend alone with the Qur'an at night will serve to really grant you firmness in the religion of Allah and firmness in the understanding of the Qur'an. It will serve to teach you to contemplate and dwell upon the meanings and formulate questions. One of the benefits of spending time with the Qur'an at night when you're alone, as mentioned by Shaykh Nasheikh Sulaiman al-Ruhayli, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, he said, that its effect on retention is more powerful than any other type of revision. If you revise the Qur'an by day, that will improve your retention, correct? But if you revise the Qur'an at night, in your night prayers, then your retention will be even stronger. It may last days more because of the fact that you reviewed it at night. Having said this, we come back to the statement of Hafiz al-Hakam. لَوْ يَعْلَمُ الْمَرْءُ قَدْرَ الْعِلْمِ لَمْ يَنَمْ If a man truly came to recognize the status of knowledge, he would not sleep. Because you see, ya ikhwan, it gets to a point that knowledge becomes a lust, a desire that is unquenched. You cannot get enough of it. You're insatiable. This is the state that a man can get to. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam highlighted this fact in a hadith. Man humani la yashba'an. There are two people with a lust or with a naham. Perhaps is translated as gluttony. Close. It's a type of of need that's insatiable. Naham. Okay? He said there's two types of people who are afflicted with this who shall never find 
الشبع they shall never feel that they got their fill طالب دنيا the first one of the two he mentioned sallallahu alayhi wasallam the seeker of the dunya the seeker of the dunya he will never get his fill it used to be commonly said in the time of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam لو كان ابن ادم واديان من ذهب لابتغى اليهما ثالثا if the son of Adam had two valleys filled with gold. He would seek to add a third. Imagine a valley. Ah, you ever seen one of those canyons, valleys? Filled with gold. All yours. Two. Huh? You would live this lifetime and then maybe ten more and still not spend all of that. If a man had this much wealth from the children of Adam, he would seek a third. This is the nature of the seeker of the dunya. وَلَا يَمْلَأُ جَوْفَ ابْنِ آدَمْ أَوْ فِي ابْنِ آدَمْ إِلَّا التُرَابِ And nothing will fill the mouth of the son of Adam except for the dust. Once you are in your grave, then you are full. This is the seeker of the dunya. طيب. It's one of the two. The second one is what? وَطَالِبُ عِلْمِ And the seeker of knowledge. The seeker of knowledge. who has been granted success by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gets to a point where he becomes insatiable as regarding knowledge. No matter how much knowledge he gains and he amasses, he still wants more. And the more he gets, the more he wants. And he keeps craving knowledge all the way until he passes. And Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala after he came to his old age, after he got to the point where he became an imam to the people, he's already the, one of the major scholars of his era, if not the most senior. He's already recognized as an imam by the government, by the rulers, and by the common folks, and by the scholars. It was said to him, how long are you going to keep seeking knowledge? They saw his diligence. They saw how much he persevered in the matter of knowledge. He's not stopping. So he said that statement, he coined that phrase that became a common law for the student of knowledge. It became the law. He said, Very easy to memorize, it even rhymes. With the mahbara until the maqbara. What is the mahbara? Hi, Ikhwan. Not you. <laughs> huh? The inkwell. The inkwell. That is correct. Fine. Because back then, as you know, they used to have, you know, the different writing instruments, whether it's like, you know, the feather, so on and so forth. And they have these inkwells, they dip into them and then they write, unlike today. That is the mahbara. Ma'al mahbara. With the mahbara. Meaning, I and it shall be companions. Until Al-Maqbara. Al-Maqbara is? The grave. The grave. We shall remain companions, we shall remain together, we shall never separate until the grave separates us. That is the law of the student of knowledge. There is never a point that comes in which the student of knowledge is saturated, he has enough. In which he says, I'm done. I made it. Huh? Is there such a point? I made it. I arrived. We're not Sufis, ya ikhwan. <laughs> According to us, wa'bud rabbaka hatta yatiyaka al-yaqeen doesn't mean that we stop worship at a certain point in time. You know, the Sufis they have this funny thing. Tafsir. They call it tafsir. In reality, it's tahrif. Wa'bud rabbaka hatta yatiyaka al-yaqeen. The verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Worship Allah until, worship your Lord until yaqeen comes to you. They say yaqeen is certainty. It's a high level of knowledge. Once you have arrived, at the level of knowledge, you stop worshipping Allah. Why? Because Allah said, Hatta, until, A'udhu Billah, Min Al Khuzlan. Right? So, according to them, many of them reach that level. But then, when you look at the Sahaba, <laughs> none of the Sahaba reached that level according to them. A'udhu Billah. The Prophet didn't reach that level according to them. La ilaha illallah. 
However, if they had the smallest amount of knowledge, they would have recognized that this is simply a trick from the shaitan, who would love to see nothing more than Aish, than to see them stop making salah. They actually make, stop making salah. I kid you not. They stop making salah. You've seen it. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Look at the shaitan, ya ikhwan. How he deceives the people. He uses their lack of knowledge to make the Qur'an become their source of misguidance. Without knowledge, you don't have no defenses against the shaitan. Knowledge is your shield. If they had the smallest amount of knowledge, they would look at the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as the source of tafsir, correct? Allah referred us to what for tafsir? The tafsir of the Qur'an itself, without a doubt, and the sunnah. The statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has the verse, Hmm? The verse that refers us to the sunnah for the tafsir of the Qur'an. Come on, Yahwan, I know you guys have it. Surah Al-Nahl, good. We have revealed to you the mention, meaning the Qur'an, لِتُبَيِّنَا Again, Lam Al-Ta'leel, Yahwan. This Lam is important. Memorize Lam Al-Ta'leel. The lamb of causation. We spoke about this earlier today. Huh? Yes. لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِ لِتُبَيِّن The cause. What's the reason? that The dhikr was revealed to Muhammad Wasallam. لِيُبَيِّن Such that he will clarify. He will bring out the meanings of the Qur'an. لِلنَّاسِ To the people. مَنُزِّلَ إِلِيهِمْ That which has been sent down to them. So one of the, the main roles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa one of the defining characteristics of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is the clarification of the Qur'an. Aisha radiallahu anha, she referred to this. When she was asked about his characteristics, his manu sallallahu alayhi wa she referred to what? The Qur'an. And then she said, كَانَ خُلُقُهُ الْقُرْآنِ His manners were the Qur'an. His life is entirely an explanation of the Qur'an. So now if we go to the Sunnah, and we seek from therein an interpretation of this verse, what do we find? In the hadith referring to Uthman ibn Mad'un, radiallahu ta'ala anhu shaykh, remind us of the hadith. As regarding Uthman radiallahu anhu, the Messenger sallam, said, he has worshipped Allah until al-yaqeen came to him. Uthman passed away, radiallahu anhu. The messenger then commented, he said, Uthman worshipped Allah until al-yaqeen came to him. So what do you then understand from this hadith? Yaqeen here means what according to Rasulullah? Death. Worship Allah until death comes to you. That is yaqeen. That is certainty. When you have seen with your own eyes the angel of death and the angels of mercy or the angels, may Allah save us all. Now, when you have seen the afterlife, you've come upon the truth, you've come upon reality, you're now seeing that which has been promised. That is yaqeen, that is certainty. There is no more certainty than this. You are, you're living it now. You're not just hearing about it. Naam? <coughs> Let's move on. We want to keep the pace inshallah and get a chance to cover more. He said, Rahimahullah ta'ala, وَمِنْ صِفَاتِ أُولِي الْإِيمَانِ نَهْمَتُهُمْ فِي الْعِلْمِ حَتَّى اللِّقَاءَ أَغْبِطْ بِذِي النَّهَامِ We just spoke about this. And from the descriptions of the people of the faith, Iman, نَهْمَتُهُمْ Their greed, their lust for knowledge. فِي الْعِلْمِ In the matter of knowledge, حَتَّى اللِّقَاءَ Until death. أَغْبِطْ بِذِي النَّهَامِ Envy them in a good way, meaning wish for the same that they have without wishing that it be removed from them with this type of desire or greed or lust. If you see someone like that, you should wish for yourself the same. You see a brother that loves the books and he loves to buy them and he loves to spend time reading them and discussing what's in them and so on and so forth with a good intention and helping the people and spreading the knowledge. Wallahi, this is someone you should envy. Not envy meaning you wish that 
he be destroyed or that he lose this gift. Now, envy in the sense that is found in the sunnah. لا حسد إلا في اثنتين. There is no hasad except in two matters. Meaning you wish the same for yourself. Then he said, and listen to this one carefully. العلم أعلى وأحلى ما له استمعت أذن وأعرب عنه ناطق بفمه. It's a tremendous statement, yeah. العلم أعلى وأحلى ما له استمعت أذن. Knowledge is the most lofty and the sweetest thing that any ear has ever heard. Can you imagine Hafiz al Hakami saying this? I try to contemplate just for a second this, this young scholar. He died extremely young, not even reaching the age of 40. He was 38, Shaykh? 37? Hmm. So, half of al Hakami didn't even reach the age of 40. And he was already at this level of scholarship that his teacher, Shaykh Abdullah al-Qara'awi, requested him when he was 19 or 18 to write a poem in Aqeedah. What did he come up with? Sulam al-Wusul. Not even 20. He wrote Sulam al-Wusul. This tremendous, magnificent poem in Aqeedah that covers the Aqeedah of the people of the Sunnah. I'm not talking about 16 verses like al or Ha'iyat ibn Abi Dawood, which is also extremely short. No. I'm talking about this long, forgive the expression, beast of a poem. Amazing thing. And then, what does he come around and do years later? He explains it in the beautiful three volumes that we have available today in the bookstores, Ma'arij al-Qabul. He explained his own poem that he wrote because of the request of his shaykh. Subhanallah, ya khwan. This book Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted it, Qabul. From the most beautiful of poems that you can read. How smooth, how sweet, how flowing the wordings, and how accurate and correct it is upon, on point regarding the aqidah of the sunnah. It is so loved by the people of knowledge that even some of the most major scholars of the ummah today are in love with it. Even Shaykh Rabi'ah was explaining it in Mecca. العلم أعلى وأحلى ما له استمعت أذن وأعرب عنه ناطق بفن. Knowledge is the loftiest and most sweet thing that any ear has ever heard or was expressed by a speaker with his mouth. This is how knowledge is, ya ikhwan, in the eyes of the people of knowledge. You cannot help but love it when it gets to that point. That there is no speech that is sweeter to you. Hey, nothing sweeter. He'd rather be with the knowledge huh, than with his new wed wife. Wife. You know, it is mentioned about some of the people of knowledge that on the night of his wedding, his new bride had to wait for hours after they got home. Because the shaykh had to go into his library for some reading. If I remember correctly, he stayed in there for six hours. Hi, ikhwan. You can clearly tell what is sweeter in this man's mind. Ibn Hazm, he talks about this in, I think, Adab al-Nufus. This is the name of the book. He makes a slight comparison here. I just want to briefly touch upon it and then we'll come back on topic. It's a benefit. He says, the way by which we know that the matter of knowledge is the sweetest thing in existence is because when people sample it and sample other things, they deem this to be the most superior. This is a very profound statement because what he's talking about is that you are only fit to compare if you actually know both. Are you fit to compare things if you don't know all of them? Hmm? How do you feel about a brother who's never been inside a Benz in his life? Never been inside one. 
right? In his life. But then he's trying to tell you, you know, the Benz this and the Benz that, but the Beamer is this and the Rolls Royce is that. And you never seen the inside of a Benz, Zahi. What you comparing for? Huh? You know what I'm saying? So, if you have never reached to that lofty status, you have no right to compare. But with this concept in mind, now look at what Ibn Hazm is saying. He's saying that all the people of the dunya have actually sampled and what they have a right to compare in is the things that they have access to. So they've sampled you know, the joys of life, the joys of eating and drinking and traveling and women, etc., etc., etc. They've sampled these things so they can make a comparison. But they've never sampled knowledge. They've never tried it. They've never tasted his joys and sweetness. Their hearts are not fit for it. And if Allah knew there was good in them, He would make them hear it. But the opposite cannot be said about the people of knowledge. For the people of knowledge have sampled the dunya and have also sampled knowledge. But what did they end up preferring? Knowledge. So due to their preference of knowledge, it becomes clear that it is the most superior of all the joys of life. الْعِلْمُ غَايَتُهُ الْقُصْوَ وَرُتْبَتُهُ الْعَلْيَاءُ فَسْعَوْ إِلَيْهِ يَا أُلِلْهِمَنْ The next verse. Knowledge, its loftiest and end goal, and the maximum level you reach in it is العلياء, superiority. This is true. This is not knowledge delivers you to alaykum Knowledge delivers you to that which is lofty, to the highest of stations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not reserve a station in nearness to Him for anyone that is higher than that which He reserved for the people of knowledge. Because you see, ya ikhwan, Nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is determined by what? By actions. Righteous actions. And those who have access to the most righteous of actions are who? Those who are most knowledgeable. In fact, anyone who doesn't have the same level of knowledge is dependent upon the people of knowledge to perform the righteous thing he is doing. Had it not been for the people of knowledge, those who are performing the righteous actions would not perform them. If you want to make a debate between which is higher, the knowledge or the jihad or this or that, all of it will come back to this argument. All of those people doing all those good deeds that could potentially be higher than knowledge are actually needed the scholars to tell them, go and do it. And so the scholars get what? Equal reward. Equal. There's nothing that equates the knowledge and status with Allah. For those who have a pure intention. Fine. So this is where knowledge delivers you. It delivers you to the most lofty of stations. So hasten to it. Hafiz al Hakim is saying. This is a command verb. He's commanding you, O student of knowledge. He's saying to you, so hasten to it. Ya ulil hima. O you who have himma, who have strong will and motivation. He is addressing real men. If you are from them, then this command is for you. This address is for you. Fasta'u ilay. So hasten to it. Ya ulil hima. Al ilmu ashrafu matlubin. Wa talibuhu. لِلَّهِ أَكْرَمُ مَنْ يَمْشِي عَلَىٰ قَدَمِ لا إله إلا الله العلم أشرف مطلوب وطالبه لله أكرم من يمشي على قدمي Knowledge is the most precious, most sacred, most lofty of all goals. And the one who is seeking it Lillahi, for the sake of Allah, is the most noble in the eyes of Allah among all those that walk on feet. These are two facts. Fact number one, knowledge is the loftiest goal. 
There is nothing more worth seeking in this life than knowledge. Consider the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the entire Qur'an from the first page until the last page did not command Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to seek more of anything with the exception of one thing. وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدِنِ عِلْمًا And say, O oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. Allah commanded him to ask him to increase him in knowledge. The other portion, that there is no one more noble before Allah, in the eyes of Allah, than the seeker of knowledge, this is also established. If the seeker of knowledge, the angels lower their wings for him. What do you think then is the status of the scholar? Now, many many texts talk about the status of the people of knowledge. Having said what we have said now, let us briefly touch upon that which we came to address. If you know knowledge is so precious, and if you know knowledge is so lofty, and if you know knowledge is indeed the best path that you can ever take and traverse in this life, then you want to be aware of these matters. Because indeed, these matters are some of the reasons that many people who traverse this path end up abandoning it, end up leaving it, because they see no fruit. They never experience the sweetness or they find it very hard to progress, or in fact, they see no progress at all, so they end up abandoning it. All of these parasites, if I may, afat, will cause an individual to leave the path of knowledge. The first one, seeking the knowledge for other than the face of Allah. That's pretty self-explanatory. But let's talk in a little bit of detail. There are three verses in the Qur'an <coughs> in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins with man kan. Anyone knows them, Ikhan, by any chance? Man kan. You remember a verse from the Qur'an that starts with man kan? This is in Surah Al-Isra. He who wants Al-Ajila, the worldly life, then we shall grant him in it whatever we choose for whomever we want. If your goal is the worldly life, then Allah will give you whatever He decides for whomever He wills. So some of those who Make that their goal, may not get anything. Some may get all that they wanted, some may get less, a lot less, some may get more than they wanted of this worldly life. It's up to Allah to decide. It's not up to them. وَمَنْ كَانَ يُرِيدُ حَرْثًا Sorry. ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَا لَهُ جَهَنَّمَ يَصْلَاهَ مَدْمُومًا مَدْحُورًا And then we make his abode Jahannam. Where he shall roast in it, dispraised and humiliated. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْفَ وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَأُولَئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا And he who seeks the akhirah, and he performs the deeds of it, the deeds of the Akhirah, meaning fulfills those conditions that pertain to the deeds of the Akhirah, al-ikhlas or mutaba'ah, then indeed for them, or for those, their efforts are going to be met with gratitude. Gratitude from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of those verses. There are more that start with the same beginning, mankana, and all these verses talk about the same thing. The preference of the worldly life or the preference of the hereafter. So this is an extremely important point, that you seek the knowledge for the akhirah, not for the dunya. Some of the examples that we are familiar with, but let's touch upon them. 
are those who seek knowledge for fame. They hear of the scholar's fame. They hear of the fame of the students of knowledge. They hear of the fact that knowledge makes people come and ask questions and this and that. They hear of all of that, they witness all of that, they see it. And so they want a piece of that fame. If that becomes the motive for seeking knowledge, is that for the akhirah or for the dunya? This person will get no reward for their knowledge. On the contrary, their knowledge will actually become what? A reason for their destruction. Now, this is one type of an ill intention. Another type is seeking knowledge for a job. And I don't mean by a job that the person wants to give da'wah. I mean the end result that they are focused on is the paycheck. Whether that job be an imam position or a teaching position or a position at a court of law in a, in a country that rules by the legislative rulings or any sort of job like that. But the end goal is what? The paycheck. Again, this is what? An example of seeking the dunya by way of knowledge. There are the examples. I mean, some things that we hear about are pretty strange. You know, amongst the people of innovation, for example, knowledge can even be a pathway by which they climb to actually descend and fall into the pits of attaining their desires. An example of seeking knowledge, like for these things, is amongst the Shia. You know, the Shia, they practice this very filthy practice. It's called muta. I don't know if you've heard about it, Ikhwan. So muta is basically temporary marriage, timed marriage, in return for a fee, an agreed upon fee. We have a word for this here in America. No, no, that's exactly it. But according to them, may Allah cleanse the earth from their filth. They say this is marriage. Now, if that's the case, one more thing that can be said here is that in certain locales, it is common practice to grant the imams of religion, according to them, their religion, their false religion, first dibs to their pick and choice from the women of the land. Whether it's someone's daughter, someone's sister, someone's auntie, someone's aunt, potentially even someone's wife. So knowledge here becomes an access point to that. Obviously, what we call knowledge is one thing and what they call knowledge is an entirely different thing. But this is not just in them, but also in different sects that are very similar to them, like the Sufis. The Sufis have the same kind of practice, but different things. May Allah save us. So all these things, what gathers them, what comes around <coughs> as an explanation for all of them, is that it is seeking the dunya through the night. The knowledge must be sought for the akhir. And there is a little test that you can perform to see if you are seeking knowledge for the akhir or not. And based on the results of that test, you know what work you need to do to get the intention where it belongs. Ask yourself, do I apply what I have learned? Do I apply what I have learned? Am I putting this into practice? Once you ask yourself this question, you could come back with answers. 
If the answer is yes, praise Allah, for He is indeed the one that is responsible for the success you have been granted. None but He. If the answer is no, the next question is why? What is the satisfaction in seeking knowledge that is not being practiced? There must be some other form of satisfaction. Seek within your own soul. Find out what the reason is. Tayyip? In the hadith, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrates that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, أَنَا أَغْنَى الشُّرَكَاءِ عَنِ الشِّرْكَ I am amongst the partners, I'm the one that is least in need of my portion. If someone performs a deed for Allah and for other than Allah simultaneously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no need of it. مَنْ عَمِلَ عَمَلًا أَشْرَكَ فِيهِ مَعِيَ غَيْرِ تَرَكْتُهُ وَشِرْكَ Whoever performs a deed in which he has associated other than I with me in it, I leave him and that deed which he has performed like that. Hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Allah has no need of deeds that are being performed for him and for other than him simultaneously. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also said, مَا مِنْ عَبْدٍ يقوم في الدنيا مقام السمعة ورياء إلا سمع الله به على رؤوس الخلائق يوم القيامة. Surely there is no slave that he stands in the dunya in a position, in a place, in a station where he can gain a reputation or be seen. Meaning he's seeking one of two things: either the people will hear about him, or people will notice and see him. That's the reason why he's doing what he's doing. He's in that station, in that place, in that position. He's seeking fame, seeking attention. Except that Allah will cause him to be a reason for the people on the Day of Judgment to hear of his affair. Meaning that Allah will make his affair so terrible on the Day of Judgment that those in the standing on the Day of Judgment shall hear about it. Tremendous threat for those who are concerned with fame and reputation in their seeking of knowledge. This hadith was authenticated by Shaykh al-Albani rahmatullahi alayhi in al-Targhib wa al-Targhib. And as you know, man sam'a or man arada al-sum'a is from sam'a. So that pertains to what is being heard. Wa man ra'a, he who seeks, uh, who does perform ziriyah, this is from al-ru'ya, from seeking to be seen. They're both about the same intention, but slightly different end results. So this is a small point of benefit here that you want to pay attention to. So there's a difference between seeking a reputation and seeking attention, seeking to be seen, but the end result is one. They're seeking the attention of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second afa. is the matter of withholding the knowledge. Withholding the knowledge. Because you see, Ikhwan, once you have attained some knowledge, there is an obligation that comes with it. And this is very similar to the concept of wealth. Once you have attained some wealth, it comes with what, Ikhwan? With obligation. Naam. Allah Jalla wa'ala blesses you with wealth, but He also makes it a test for you. The test of wealth, to give the yearly zakat, for example, if you have currency, gold and silver and their likes. And uh, from the test of wealth as well, is to give uh, and spend in all the avenues that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made obligatory or preferred and so on. So likewise, the matter of knowledge comes with a price or an obligation. And that is to spread it. And that is to spread it, spread this knowledge. If you have gained knowledge, it becomes obligatory upon you to spread it, each individual according to his ability. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even said, بَلِّغُ عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةً Deliver from me even if a single verse. 
He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Nadbar Allah Humri and Samia Minna Makalatin, Fawaha Fadaha Kama Simia, or call it Kama Kama Kal Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah beautify or make virile or healthy the face of an individual who hears some speech of ours and then memorizes it and then delivers it exactly as he memorizes it. This is encouragement to deliver what? The sunnah. So the first one is an encouragement to deliver the Qur'an. The second one is an encouragement to deliver the sunnah. These are hadith, ya ikhwan. Is the Messenger of Allah here addressing the scholars? Huh? La. Who is he addressing? Everyone. Every member of the ummah. Kullu Muslim. If you can deliver an ayah exactly as you heard it, with the correct delivery, deliver it. You don't know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will place in terms of blessings. Likewise a hadith. From the common misconceptions that we are dealing with today in this era, especially in these lands, is that people are making obstacles and barriers to the spreading of knowledge. مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ بِهَا مِنْ سُلْطَانِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed no text regarding. In order for you to give da'wah, then you have to be qualified with this and that and so on and this condition, and that condition, and where have you studied, and who's your shaykh? Ya akhi subhanallah, it got to the point that some people are starting to feel like I can't even share a benefit with my wife. Unless I got Fulan's signature on the bottom of the screenshot. Hi akhwan. This is a very strange affair, wallahi. Here is the Messenger of Allah addressing the ummah, بَلِّغُ anni walaw ayah. Deliver on my behalf even of a single verse. Then we have Fulan and Fulan saying, Who are you to speak in the deen of Allah? La ilaha illallah. Wallahi, this is a methodology that is foreign to the people of the Sunnah. The scholars were never upon this. Ever. Rather, what is criticized, and this is another afa that we can talk about inshaAllah in a follow-up session. Tonight we're just going to take these two. This is the second one and we're going to finish with this. Another alpha that we're going to talk about is speaking without knowledge. That is a problem. Speaking without knowledge, calling to others in the sunnah. This is an alpha, this is a big problem. And we can discuss that. That is dispraised. That is something you want to put, put the stop to. That is where you want to press the brakes. But if someone is calling to nothing but the sunnah and the Quran, why put a stop to this? Now, this is not something that should be stopped. Further, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْتُمُونَ مَا أَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَالْهُدَى مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا بَيَّنَّاهُ لِلنَّاسِ فِي الْكِتَابِ أُولَٰئِكَ يَلْعَنُهُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَلْعَنُهُمُ الْدَاعِنُونَ Indeed, those who withhold, those who hide, that which you have revealed of that which is the clear verses and guidance, after we have clarified it to the people in the book, those, Allah curses them. And all the cursors curse them. And the curse, as the scholars have explained, is only the result of a kabirah. Is only the result of committing one of the major sins. It's a major sin to withhold the knowledge if you have it. Because you see, withholding the knowledge ends up resulting in something. And that is what? Stopping one of the sha'air of al-Islam. شَعِيرَةُ الْأَمْرِ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَالنَّهِي عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ One of the, the defining characteristics and the hallmarks for which the religion of Islam is famous and this ummah is famous. كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ We're the best of nations ever to be brought out to the people. Commanding the good, enjoining it, and forbidding the evil. This is a defining characteristic of the Muslims. Withholding the knowledge results in one. And stopping. People don't want to Enjoin the good, and people don't want to forbid the evil. This is withholding the knowledge. This is a reason for the curse of Allah to come upon the people, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed us about the nation's past. لُعِنَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ عَلَى لِسَانِ دَاوُدَ وَعِيسَ بْنِ مَرْيَمْ كَانُوا لَا يَتَنَهُونَ عَمْ مُنْكَرٍ فَعَلُوا They used to not forbid each other from evil that they committed. They were cursed upon the tongues of Dawood alayhi salam and Isa ibn Maryam alayhi as salatu wa salam. So this is a reason for the curse of Allah azza wa jal to fall upon the people withholding the knowledge. Further, 
in the hadith, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned من سئل عن علم فكتمه ألجم يوم القيامة بلجام منا Whoever is asked about a matter of knowledge and then he hides it on the day of judgment he shall be rained or there's another word, there's another term اللجام harnessed with a harness of fire you know the harness or the lijam, the reins that you put on a horse to ride it, that allows you to, to steer it? And, and, naam? Yeah, and it comes with a, you know, a specific piece of metal that goes in its mouth. And the riddle, I think they call it, or the bridle, I'm not sure the pronunciation. Bridle, okay. And that thing that goes in the horse's mouth and is you know, tied with these pieces or straps of leather or rope or whatsoever, what have you, is, is to steer it with on the day of judgment the individual who is asked about knowledge which he has of course which he has and then he refuses to give it he shall be harnessed on the day of judgment bridled with a bridle of fire again this is a very clear indication that the matter of withholding the knowledge is what? a major sin kabir min kabair Abu Dhar radiyallahu an Abi Dhar he said لو وضعتم الصمصامة على هذه and he pointed towards the back of his neck if you put the samsama upon this one the samsama is a description of a sword not just any sword a sword that is incisive and does not bend when a sword is described like that it is called a samsama some of the people of knowledge said, rather it is a one-edged sword, doesn't have double edges. Okay? Then it's called a samsama. At any rate, he said, if you put the samsama right here, and he pointed at the back of his neck. And then I had hope that I would still be able to narrate one more hadith before the, done, the deal is done, I would narrate. He's saying that if between me and death there was nothing left but these few seconds, then I would still want to narrate more knowledge before I die. Now, this is obviously a statement not just of keenness upon attaining good deeds and nearness to Allah, but also a statement of what? Of courage. Because as you know, the matter of spreading knowledge requires a certain amount of courage. Because forever people will oppose the spread of knowledge. The people of falsehood, the people of kufr, the followers of the shayateen, the people of bid'ah, and sometimes you will even find takhdeel from amongst the ranks of the people of the sunnah. Sometimes, even them. Tayyib? So, the spreading of knowledge requires courage. Tayyib. The final narration we're going to close with tonight, and I ask Allah to reward you all tremendously for your patience, ya ikhwan, and perseverance in attaining these classes. May Allah Azza wa Jal multiply your reward and make it tremendous. The final narration we're going to uh, narrate tonight is a hadith found in Al-Tabarani's Awsat. Shaykh Al-Albani rahmatullahi alayhi hassanahu, ranked it hassan, in both Al-Targhib wa Tarheeb and Al-Sirsal Al-Sahihah. That the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and this is on the authority of Abu Hurairah. Pay attention to this hadith. مثل الذي يتعلم العلم ثم لا يحدث به كمثل الذي يكنز الكنز فلا ينفق منه. The similar to the analogy of an individual who learns the knowledge and then does not narrate it is the similitude of an individual who hoards the wealth and then doesn't spend from it. Just like we deem repugnant an individual 
who hoards wealth, hoards money, and just keeps amassing more and more and more, and he doesn't spend. Obviously, when an individual doesn't spend, he's not just not spending on the stranger. He's not spending on his family, not even himself. Sometimes you see some of these people who are afflicted with hoarding. This is a trial, this is a test, it's a disease. Now, you will see them filthy, dirty, torn clothes, torn shoes, acting like the poorest of people, although he is hoarding potentially millions at home. Now, this is obviously what? A disease. So, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he refers to the likes of these people, they are diseased. Hmm? So he's saying the similitude, the analogy of an individual who learns the knowledge and then does not narrate it, is the similitude of the one who hoards the wealth and doesn't spend from it. If you learn, make it a habit to spend from that which you have learned. For indeed, the matter is as Al-Ildiri rahimahullah ta'ala said, وَكَنْزٌ لَا تَخَافُ عَلَيْهِ لِصْطَى يَزِيدُ بِكَثْرَةِ الْإِنْفَاقِ مِنْهُ وَيَنْقُصُ إِنْ بِهِ كَفَّنْ شَدَدَّهُ Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar It is a treasure that you fear no thief for Knowledge is in your chest, no thief can steal it from you It increases the more you spend from it If you spend from it abundantly, it increases This is the affair of knowledge the more you spread it, the more you share the benefits, the more you gain. Make it a habit, ya ikhwan. Share the benefits. And it decreases if you make your fist tight with it. If you become greedy and stingy with knowledge, you don't want to share, you don't want to teach, etc., etc. You don't have time to come to the masjid to share with your brothers, or, or, or. Then it's going to decrease. Naam. والله أعلم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وآله وصحبه أجمعين جزاكم الله خيرا يا إخوان وأحسن الله إليكم ونفعنا الله وإياكم بما نقول ونسمع